The talk is about memtable pluggability and the kind of memtables, alternate memtable implementations that we have in, in Cassandra 5. And let's start with why we want to do anything about memtables at all. Uh, the memtable is this uh, very important piece of the um, Cassandra local storage. Uh, this is the first place where every piece of data goes to be before being uh, reorganized and written into SS tables. And it has a lot of work to do. It has to take data from, from the user. It has to organize it in a way that's suitable for, uh, for retrieval. And finally, it has to prepare it for, uh, for being flushed into an SS table. Um, so it's also on the synchronous part of every write. So um, uh, it has to acknowledge a write before the user knows that something can, can later be read by, by users. And in this example, we, uh, we have some, some writes happening, a read. Uh, being done for by user three, and finally something being flushed on SS table. Uh, why are memtables important? Uh, they they are probably the most important thing for the performance of a of the database. Uh, on the first hand, uh, the fact that it's on the synchronous path of every write means that uh, it directly determines the the, the write throughput, the peak write throughput when you're uh, taking a lot of data in a in a short term. Um, we do more processing of every write, but that happens in the background, so it doesn't really slow down your other, other processing until eventually things get um, saturated. And then um, the memtable also matters because the bigger the memtable is, the, the bigger we can make the level zero SS tables. And these SS tables determine uh, also the height of the compaction hierarchy or how much work the compaction has to do uh, for you to be able to read things as quickly as, quick, quickly as you want. Uh, and also another part why it's very important is that uh, memtables are things that stay in memory. And in large part, this means that they stay on heap. And because uh, they also stay on heap for, for a long time, they're not something that can be very easily handled by the garbage collector. And they have a lot of complexity inside them, which makes them uh, hard to process. Um, so to, to be able to do improvements on, on the mem tables in Cassandra, we uh, started, uh, well, the best way to do something like this is to uh, play with different implementations, try them out, uh, compare them against each other. And the best way to do it is by uh, supporting some kind of, kind of pluggability of implementations into Cassandra. And uh, since Cassandra 4.1, uh, we've been able to support pluggable memtable implementations. We have an interface that the memtable implementation needs to support. And once you do this, uh, you're able to um, first define um, memtable configurations in, in the Cassandra YAML. Uh, like in these examples here, there are uh, skip list, sharded, and try configurations. You can choose one configuration to, to be your default for, uh, for the database. And you can also decide to use a specific memtable implementation for specific tables. So it may be that some tables are not suitable for some types of data. In that case, you can uh, just choose the ones that you want for, for every table individually. Um, and in, we have, at the moment, three different implementations that are provided with Cassandra. Uh, the first one is the skip list memtable, which is the, basically the legacy, uh, legacy memtable implementation in Cassandra. That's the one that we've been using since, I think, 3.0. Um, and it's, um, um, it's implemented as a concurrent skip list of partitions. And for every partition, we have a B tree that defines um, the map uh, to individual rows within the partition. And uh, we have even more B trees below that to, to, to find the actual individual cell. Um, something that's important about this is that while you can store the, the data for, um, for every cell off heap, all of these organizing structures, the B trees, the skip list, uh, multiple levels of B trees, and all of the B trees for each individual partition, they're all on heap, uh, which forms a very complex, complex structure. Um, the, the second implementation we currently have, uh, which was made as a kind of a proof of concept for the, for the pluggability piece in 4.1, was this sharded skip list mem table. At one point, when we started trying out Cassandra with uh, nodes that have lots and lots of uh, cores, uh, above 20, 40, 60, 
you start seeing that the, um, the mem table or the concurrent skip list becomes a bit of a bottleneck uh, because it's uh, contended uh, to write um, start slowing each other down. And uh, one of the ways you can improve on things like this is by sharding the mem table. And we implemented this uh, simple solution which basically uh, puts uses several independent skip lists instead of one. And this way you can take advantage of uh, many more cores that you could with uh, just a single concurrent, uh, concurrent skip list. Um, so this one also supports a blocking mode where every time you write to a shard, uh, I mean, you, it serializes the writes to individual shards. And in some cases, it can, this can be uh, beneficial because on one hand, it lets other pieces of the machinery like compaction uh, have more ability to work. And on the other hand, it saves some, um, um, some memory because sometimes we may attempt to write something and then fail because the compare and swap um, didn't work. Uh, I'll give some examples how this is beneficial a little bit later. And the third one is the, um, the most important uh, um, new addition, which is the trimem table. Um, this is coming with Cassandra 5. Um, it's a very different implementation. So in, instead of using a skip list for, for the partition map, it uses a try, which is a different data structure. And it's uh, aiming to solve quite a few of the problems of the, um, of the existing of the legacy as stable solution. And uh, if you switch to, to it, you're supposed, I mean, you're expected to get a much better performance as well as garbage collection efficiency. Um, uh, now let's talk a little bit more in depth about this new um, MEM table and how it works. Um, the, there's a key concept that uh, these new MEM tables use and it's called byte order. Uh, if you, sorry, um, yeah. So if you if you think about the legacy mem tables, then basically every every typical solution for uh, storing maps in, in any database is usually comparison based, which means that you have uh, your types, you have your function, which is uh, able to compare two values in the same type, and your structures are based on comparing different values of the of the same type. And by this, you're building um, things like B trees, which uh, every time you're making a decision, you're comparing two values and deciding which way to go. Um, the problem with this is, on one hand, that uh, because you need a comparison, uh, you, you need to be able to give values to the compar comparing function. You have to have these values in forms which are comparable. Uh, you can't take just part of the value and compare it with a part of the value. It has to be the whole thing to be able to pass it to the function. Uh, so uh, the keys can be short, like integers, but they also can be very long if you have strings or something like this. Um, and it often happens that in um, keys, you would have repeated prefixes. If it's a string, uh, which is a path to something, part of the string will repeat. If it's a multi-component key, where you have uh, several, uh, several clustering columns, for example, you can have, you would often have uh, m many of the leading components being the same thing and just the last component, for example, being different to, uh, to point to the specific, specific row. And if you're not taking care to form a, form, uh, a, a type of hierarchy between the maps, you're going to be repeating a lot of the comparisons you do when, you, when you're walking this structure. Um, so there is a balance here to make between uh, repeating prefixes or adding code to the system to make it work a little bit better and save also on space. Um, another part about the, uh, our implementation of uh, the, uh, the structures is that they're um, partly because of this uh, problem with keys in comparable forms, uh, all of these things have to be kept on heap with a lot of overhead. And uh, this basically means that the on heap size of a mem table is much larger, typically much larger than the, um, the, the data size, which can be put off heap. And uh, of course, that structure is very complex, uh, having all the, um, all the trees um, for the different levels of the maps. And uh, when you do modifications to it, you have to, uh, you throw away some objects and you create new objects. 
and these objects are not immediately thrown away, they stay around for a long time, uh, they get promoted to um, um, higher generations of the compaction, uh, sorry, uh, of the garbage collection um, hierarchy. So they're not easy at all for the garbage collector to reclaim, and this complicates the process of garbage collection. So uh, what, what did we do about, about these two problems? Um, the approach we took is based on um, byte comparable keys. So if you imagine, for example, that uh, in, in a database we're not storing different types, but just strings as keys. If we're using just strings as keys, one can think of, uh, one knows that for strings you have a lexicographical comparison, which means that um, if you're trying to compare two strings, you can start from the beginning and the first time you find a difference, you can immediately tell which one of the two strings is smaller which means that if you're trying to find some place that splits between uh, two strings, you can shorten it up to some prefix rather than having the whole, um, the whole string or the whole key, uh, which, which is an, in itself can be an advantage, but it can also be used in structures that are specifically made for, for this, kind of, um, this kind of structure of the keys. And uh, these are called tries. It's something that's been around for, um, since the 60s and uh, it's something that's also generally been not used in databases until recently. Um, so yeah, the key idea here is that we have a little bit better understanding of keys because we have this prefix, uh, prefix decisions, which lets us have better efficiency. Uh, well, the problem with Cassandra is that we have different types. We have more than just strings. We have also integers, we have floating points, we have uh, big integers or even big decimals, which are uh, not comparable directly um, as bytes. So what we can do to sort, sort out this problem is to do a translation of the, of the, of the value into a byte comparable form. For some things, it's pretty easy. For example, if you take integers, they're not comparable directly because uh, negative integers have their um, highest bit set to one and positive integers have their highest bit set to zero. So negative integers come, before, uh, come after the positive integers if you directly compare them. But if you flip the top bit, then they start being byte comparable. Uh, you can do a very similar trick for floating points in the uh, IEEE floating points. Uh, you flip the head bit, and also if it's a negative number, you flip all the other, all the other bits, and it works exactly as normal comparisons would. You can do that, that sort of translation for all of the types that uh, Cassandra has. And also you can form um, concat I mean, translations of uh, multiple components as a one flat single um, byte ordered sequence, which makes it easier for the code that's uh, below um, in the core database to just ignore anything about the internal structure of the keys and just deal with this flat sequence of bytes. Um, so the trimem table, which we introduced with CEP19, um, is a implementation of such a, such a data structure for, for the mem table. It uses key translation to take all of the uh, partition keys uh, into byte comparable sequences. Then it replaces simply the skip list on the highest level of the, uh, of the mem table hierarchy with a try. Uh, the reason why it's just uh, the partition map is because this work is not yet completely done. So we have done only one step of the process. We're still getting a huge advancements, uh, uh, huge improvements, but it's um, currently only replacing the partition map. It works very well for key value workloads at the moment because of that. Um, now, the try itself is uh, something that we um, built uh, internally because we needed some features that um, you couldn't really get anywhere. Uh, there are some, I mean, one of the, the main structures that uh, would, people would use for something like this is uh, uh, something that came out of uh, the adaptive radix tree paper um, from 2013. Um, there are some implementations of that, but we needed a few additional features that they couldn't provide. For example, uh, being able to read uh, concurrently with data being written to the, to the try, which is really important for the performance of the database. Um, 
We also did a few, a few extra tricks to make it efficient, which I'm not going to go into detail because we don't have the time. Um, and finally, because they are a single writer structure, um, which was much easier to write and much easier to make uh, correct than, than fully concurrent structures, you have to shard the main table into a few independent uh, trees so that you can use more cores and do more parallel writes uh, at the same time. Um, what did we get out of this? Um, one of the first things that uh, we could see is that uh, random accesses into the, the main table are about twice faster. So um, 1.8 times faster. Um, so in this, in this test, we wrote 10, 10 million entries uh, for a quick micro benchmark. Uh, the time it took to write these 10 million benchmarks was about two and a half times faster using the try um, mem table rather than, than the skip list one. Uh, and querying them is, again, almost two times faster than the legacy mem table implementation. Uh, the other thing that's important is the size of the resulting structure. Um, if you're using heap buffers for, for everything, you can see that it's... Uh, huge drop of the size of the, uh, the um, well, a significant drop of the size of the, the mem table uh, from close to 6,000 6, to four, four and a half or some, something like that uh, gigabytes for the same amount of data. If you're putting the data off heap, uh, both are, are again smaller because you can take a little bit more uh, off heap and you need less overhead when your data is in these off heap objects rather than than buffers, um, but you can see how small a part um, is of heap for the skip list mem table, and that almost doubles when you're switching to a try mem table because now we can also put the the try of heap, which makes it uh, well. Th there are two effects of this. One is that uh, because the trigger for flashing is the amount of uh, memory you have on heap then you reduce, the, uh, you reduce the frequency of flashing. You store more data before you need to flash again, uh, which is very helpful for, for the performance later. And if you look at longer term performance, uh, we did a few NoSQL tests filling um, a node with about one terabyte of data, of very small, um, about 100 byte payloads. And you can see this here is uh, just the first hour of the test in which you can see that uh, the burst or the peak write throughput of the, um, of the same database, only replacing the mem table with a tri mem table, the, uh, it can take almost twice as many writes per second. Um, and this, this can be sustained for, for very long periods. Uh, in this case, the test ran for uh, something like uh, a day and a half. And um, the blue graph is the one using um, using trimem tables, and the orange one is the one using skip list. You can see that uh, it maintains over twice better throughput throughout this test. Uh, the reason why this uses uh, not open source Cassandra was because the, at the time we did this test, uh, the other things necessary for, for this kind of uh, performance weren't yet in, in open source Cassandra. They are now. You're going to see it in a minute. Um, yeah, so some of the things that also are important that um, in addition to the throughput increase, we get latent latency reduction if you're doing fixed, uh, fixed rate reads and writes. Um, it's about 30%. You can also see that uh, every time you're creating a new SS table on level zero, it's about 30% bigger, which means sometimes you may need one less level of the compaction hierarchy, which can be a significant improvement. And something that, uh, uh, that was really important for me personally is that we can definitely see the, a reduction in the total garbage collection time for, for, this, for this test or for any test that we've actually done um, on the order of more than twice. Now, uh, something else I wanted to uh, discuss is the effect of sharding and how um, um, 
whether sharding is a good thing or a bad thing, basically. Because um, if your data is well distributed, if you're um, in partition hashing or the, the, the partitioner works well and is able to distribute everything uh, in, in a good way, uh, then sharding definitely helps. Even if you're using just a simple skip list, and even if you're using a blocking variation of the skip list, which uh, can only do one, one write at a time uh, to, the, to the skip list, your performance improves improves by something like 10 to 20 percent just by just by sharding the, the mem table um, and the try mem table is uh, about twice better than, than the skip list in that case but then once you start introducing skew uh, things start to get better for the uh, for the skip list mem table until eventually when you have every second write uh, going to the same partition for the specific test then the skip list is uh, is better than than all the other solutions that the plain concurrent skip list is better than all the other solutions. But for anything realistic, up to 20 even percent, you can see that uh, the tries and the, uh, the sharded solutions are, are doing at least as well. Now, um, this was the part of the talk which um, uh, Intel uh, was supposed to cover. They uh, started about, what was it, three years ago or something, or maybe even more. Um, they started work on um, uh, making Cassandra work well for their persistent, persistent memory uh, products. And uh, what they initially wanted to do was to uh, create a completely separate um, storage system for Cassandra. But it turns out that we can actually get exactly the same benefit by uh, exactly the same end result by uh, just using their thing as a mem table which never flushes. So a mem table that never flushes is the same thing as a completely separate, uh, separate storage system. So um, in this graph here, uh, there's a mem table, I mean, our mem table inter interface that we implemented for flaggability. You can use it on skipless mem table that flushes to disk from time to time, or in a tri mem table that flushes to disk from time to time. Or you can use a pmem, uh, persistent memory mem table which never flushes and only stores the data in um, persistent memory. Because that memory is persistent, you also don't need any commit log um, because it just starts with what, what you had uh, the next time you restart the machine. Um, yeah, this project is not merged into Cassandra mainline because the persistent memory products were, were dis discontinued and uh, they didn't see any point in continuing and finishing, finishing the work. But let me give some details about how, how this worked. Um, the actual implementation was done using a uh, direct implementation of the art, uh, of the ideas of the art paper. Uh, they used the same byte, byte order translation of the keys that I talked about uh, a few slides ago. Uh, all of the data is in memory, so you're doing in-place updates, uh, very similar how you would do it in a classical SQL database. Um, and because their processing was single-threaded, um, it's sharded and always blocking. So uh, unlike our solution, they couldn't read uh, a piece of data while the same shard is being written to, which is a bit of a disadvantage. Um, they didn't give me any, any performance numbers to share actual performance observed, but uh, they were saying that they expected something between two and six times better performance than, um, than the normal mem tables when you expand them to a, to a big, big enough size. Um, one thing that's interesting about this is that uh, the, uh, the mem table pluggability interface in this case actually completely allows us to, uh, to replace the storage engine of Cassandra. So we have a mem table. Um, the mem table controls whether or not you, you're actually flushing when the database asks you to flush. And it doesn't trigger any flushing on its own uh, because it doesn't fill up. Um, it also controls whether or not you need a, a commit log. You need to write anything to the commit log or not. Um, and some of the other things that you, uh, you need to do for, for it to work well with Cassandra, like streaming data from one node to another, um, you can do, I mean, you, you can get the concept of how this could be done much more easily if you think about it as just a mem table. Uh, when, when, when it's time to stream something, for example, you can give a range to the mem table and say, please dump this into an SS table. 
so that you can then share, uh, stream it over. And the other side can say, uh, I don't want this in, the, in an SS table, I want to receive it directly to the main table, and this works. Um, so the next time anyone needs or wants to do a separate storage system, they can do it using this, this pluggability interface. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, work that's related to, um, to these main tables, or basically to tries and to byte order. Um, in Cassandra 5, we have uh, two more pieces. Um, one is the BTI as a stable format, which is um, basically you take the same uh, data format as the, the legacy um, as a stable format, and you replace the primary index with something that's based on tries. Um, and again, for the keys, we take their byte, byte order translation. Um, because we already have the, the complete keys and the data, we don't need to store the full keys in, in, the, in the index. We just need to store some prefixes which lets us point to the exact place where the key should be. So uh, this can be much more compact than, um, than the previous indexes. Um, it's much faster to read, uh, uh, again, depending on what your workload is. It's typically about twice faster. Um, accessing a single, a single SS table. Uh, something that's really important and really nice about it is that uh, there's no need to manage any key cache or any index summary if you're using this format because it doesn't use it. The try uh, does. The try is fast enough that if you add to it a key cache, it's going to slow things down. Um, and the, the index summary, uh, because the structure is very page friendly, it can actually um, efficiently be cached in memory just by, by the page caching of the operating system. Another thing that's really important, we talked about rows per partition in the previous talk. Um, this format can handle millions of rows. It doesn't have any problems with, uh, with lots and lots of rows because it's, again, it uses the same kind of structure which you can very quickly index into and find what you're looking for. You don't have to copy the structure to memory which you would need to do to do the binary searches in the, the legacy structures. Um, it's used exactly as it is on disk, and uh, we've tested it out with millions of rows, and it works well. The other uh, related work, you can call SAI also uh, something that's based heavily on, on tries and, and byte order. It's not for everything that SEI does, but some of the types that, uh, that it does are handled by, uh, by the same tries implementation, uh, both for main tables and on disk, and, uh, and byte order. Um, another thing I wanted to mention in this talk is that we, with uh, Cassandra 5.0, uh, we've opted to keep uh, compatibility in the default configuration of, of Cassandra which means that most of the things I'm talking about today or any other people are going to talk about in the rest of the conference, most of them are turned off by default. And if you want to uh, run your system or benchmark your system or just test it or start uh, seeing what you, can, what you could achieve from, from Cassandra, uh, we didn't have a way to, um, to select all of these options. Uh, so we're going to be supplying a new configuration file called CassandraLatest.yaml, which uh, turns, turns all these things on. Why is this important? One of the reasons you can see on the right side, um, the performance of writes is several times faster. And uh, I mean, just because these improvements uh, can, can make your life easier. So, um, yeah, this was uh, the end of my talk. Uh, here are a few pointers to um, a few papers that talk about uh, tries and byte order being used in, in databases. Uh, the first one is the ART paper, the so-called ART paper, Adaptive Radix 3. I think I actually have a mistake here. I think they wrote it 3 as a, with double E. Uh, the other one is a, um, an, another example of how you can use uh, tries on, for indexes on disk. And the third one is uh, the paper which is around exactly this work that I um, discussed in this talk.
I'm ready for questions. So. Yeah, so the default value, um, ah, sorry, uh, so the question is, um, yeah, the, the sharded structures uh, have a parameter, which is the number of shards that uh, you would like to, use, uh, you would want to use. Um, by default, the number of shards, if you don't, don't supply this parameter, is set to the number of CPU cores. That's often sufficient. But if you want to get the, the highest possible write performance, you maybe want to increase it a little bit. Uh, there are metrics that you can that you can look at in, um, by JMX, I th uh, as far as I uh, remember, uh, which tell you how much congestion you have, how much uh, threads are waiting for for another thread to free up to, um, and if you see that these are uh, going up you can increase the number of shards. Because it's a mem table, you can do it at any time, and it's, uh, it's going to take immediate effect, practically. Yeah, uh, Derek? Uh, in your diagram in the uh, you had basically a single byte drive that uh, there's, a, there's a unifix drive to the side, or there's Yeah, it is a variable length try. Um, I actually have slides for that, but um, <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, so um, the um, the view on the try is a byte try. So you can do, uh, you, you look at it as, as if all the transitions are bytes. Okay. Internal implementation can use um, multiple bytes. Okay. You can, it can use, well, it's, it's using fixed size blocks because that's easier to, to manage in terms of memory management. You can allocate and free something like this very easily. But it's also because the, um, the cache is very happy when you're using the same size of uh, blocks and these blocks are close to 32, 64, something like that, like a cache line. Yeah, and so in 32 bytes uh, with four byte pointer, the, the most you can, the widest you can go is eight. So uh, in some cases, we would do three-bit transitions. In some cases, if the, the point in, in the try is not branching that much, you would just list all the possible transitions into one block. In other cases, where you just have a lot of uh, single, single byte transitions going to down the, the path, you just put up to 28 of them into the, single, into the same block. It's the memory management of the blocks individually for the try, of the pointers and nodes of the try is done by us. Um, the, um, we're allocating blocks using G and J E malloc most of the time for, for off heap. And you can do it on heap using just allocating a big on heap buffer as well. So that's, I mean, your off heap, uh, your, your main table option for for the data storage, also it selects whether these are kept on heap or off heap. If you're selecting heap buffers, they will be on heap. If it's off heap, anything, it will be taken taken out. Uh, yes. Have I seen situations where the the on disk try doesn't work that well? Honestly, I haven't. Um, and um, this actually has been in production since uh, 20, since uh, DataStack 6, which is uh, at least five years ago. And I haven't seen anyone complain. Yes. Uh, which one? On um, by key churning, you mean thread efficiency? Um, I think there only is 
available via JMX. I'm not sure on on that. If there's an automatic way to to get to JMX stats via virtual tables, you could get to them, but I don't I don't know. Yes. This is just key value. I mean, this this version of the triangle table is only key value uh, key value stores because it only replaces the partition map. Uh, in a few months, hopefully, we'll have a version that, that does more than this. And the uh, the main reason to do that is not to have more performance, but actually to get more of the uh, the structures off heap and out of the reach of the uh, the garbage collector. Um, I think it was G1 for, for the tests. Yes? So the question is whether we can have one one huge mem table for everything, and that's something that actually haven't I haven't uh, seriously considered. And you you hinted at the reason it's uh, because it's going to be much easier to um, to drop the things that you've actually uh, flushed onto disk. Ah. I think that's a few years away at least though. <laughs> it's a it's not a bad idea in general. Yeah. Okay, if there are no further questions, um thank you for uh, being here. <laughs>